So those of you who can't see what's on this table, I'll just show you. Money. Lots and lots of money. And gold, too. All right. Uh, Danny, do not count this in the offering. Um, you may be sorely disappointed when we take it to the bank. So I was leaving home. You know, preparing my mind to present to you God's words on today. And I give my, my son and daughter a hug. And, and Gavin says to me, All right, Daddy, have a good time. Don't get fired. <laughs> like, where does that even come from? How, how distressing that is to hear that as you're preparing to present God's word is, Daddy, don't get fired. I hope my son is not a prophet. That would be absolutely horrible. Um, but I do want to thank you all for your prayers and for your continued support, cards and phone calls, and checking on my wife and my mother-in-law. Diamond is now back in the States. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the state of Arizona. She's been in the States. She was across the country. So she's back in Arizona, so praise God for that. Her mother has gotten favor favorable um, future treatment. Uh, they are approving her for an experimental drug that has been very successful in treating her particular cancer. So they're going to move forward with that, I believe, in the next few days. So please continue praying for us um, and for her mother's recovery. So I'm going to invite you to the subject this morning, looking for fruit. Looking for fruit. And we'll be in Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 25. Pop quiz, pop quiz. What is my favorite fruit? Figs. You guys do listen. Yes, figs is my favorite fruit, so we will talk a little bit about figs today. And by the way, I just want to say thank you to everyone who had brought me uh, dried figs and placed them in my office and out the office door following that sermon. Um, I still have bags and bags left, so don't do that this time. <laughs> but I do appreciate that. All right, so looking at Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 14. It says, on the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree with leaves, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. I want you to repeat after me. Nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. So following morning worship, before the pandemic, there were instances where we were, my wife and my family would get into the car, and we were driving, and then that inevitable question is asked, right? Where do we go for lunch? And several times, we said, let's go to Chick-fil-A. My kids love Chick-fil-A, and we're on our route to Chick-fil-A right here down on Stapley, and we're thinking about what we're going to order. My kids are, you know, the kids' chicken nugget meal with Polynesian and ranch and a Sprite and a root beer. We're all excited about Chick-fil-A after worship. Only to find out. Chick-fil-A is closed on Sunday. I mean, we, we pull up to the parking lot. The lights are out. The parking lot is empty. And then we remember, oh, that's right. Chick-fil-A is, is closed on Sunday. Ah, the disappointment. The disappointment. And I think this is probably what Jesus felt. As he's traveling from Bethany, the Bible tells us that he's hungry. So he's feeling these hunger pains, and he sees a fig tree in the distance. And he walks to that fig tree in hopes of plucking a fig or two to satisfy his hunger. But the tree is without fruit. Fig trees. Here's a fun fact about fig trees. The leaves and fruit 
and the fig tree grow together simultaneously. So to see a fig tree with leaves and fruit of what? That there's fruit there on the tree. So when Jesus saw the fig tree full of leaves, in his mind, there's fruit. I'm going to have my hunger satisfied. Only to be sorely disappointed when he found no figs. This fig tree in particular had yielded leaves, but with no fruit, which Jesus knew was absolutely absurd. The fig tree appeared to be with fruit, but upon closer investigation, it proved to be absolutely fruitless, deceiving Jesus and his disciples. Let's look at Mark 11, 15 through 16. And so then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple, and began to drive out those who sold and brought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers, and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. So the Jerusalem temple and the religious leaders I believe, are like the fig tree. When you look at this passage of scriptures, you see Jesus confronting the fig tree, there's the incident in the temple, and then following that, there's a fig tree. So the temple situation is sandwiched in between two fig tree passages. And I think that's really important for us to truly understand what was going on at the temple and how Jesus decided to respond to it. So as Jesus confronted the fig tree, he is determined to confront the religious leaders of his day. From a distance, the fig tree hid its fruit. And I would say likewise, the temple gave a false impression of being a place dedicated to the service of God in the time of Jesus. So on the outside, people assume those who entered the temple those who worked in the temple, those who served in the temple from the outside, people assumed that these people were religious, that they were spiritual, that they were fruitful, that they were loving, that they had an authentic relationship with God. The temple was fruitful in appearance, but it was barren, but it was deficient spiritually. I believe the temple had become what God had never intended it to be. And that's why Jesus is so angry. In Mark chapter 11, moving on to verse 17, it says, And he was teaching them, saying to them, Is it not written that my house should be called the house of prayer for all nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. It's interesting that Jesus was quoting from Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 11. And I don't know if you ever read this verse or this passage in Jeremiah, but it's very, very telling and interesting about what was happening with the religious people in regards to the temple in the time of Jeremiah. I'll give you a quick summary. Jeremiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 11. You will see that these individuals, the, the Israelites, trusted in a mantra which brought them a false sense of security. And this was their mantra. This is the temple of the Lord. And the Bible repeats it again. This is the temple of the Lord. And the third time, this is the temple of the Lord. This was their mantra. They had a false sense of security and what they were saying. The Bible goes on to tell us in Jeremiah that they were full of injustice. They were partial. They were biased. They were discriminatory in their actions towards others. They oppressed the foreigner, the immigrant, the fatherless, the widows. Those who were marginalized, those who lived on the fringe of society, They felt they had no place in the Lord's temple. 
Jeremiah goes on to say, through the inspiration of God, that they shed innocent blood. They were polytheistic, which means they followed other gods. They committed adultery, they stole, they sacrificed to idols. These were God's people in God's house committing these heinous actions. And so in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 11, God says this to Jeremiah, Has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. So the Lord is saying, yes, my house, that you say, this is the temple of the Lord. This has become a den of robbers. The temple had become what God had never intended. What does it mean to be a den of robbers? The den is where the robbers would retreat to after committing a crime. It's the place where they hid all of their loot, all of their treasure in the temple, in the Lord's house. Don't we too have a mantra that we live by? Don't we too have titles and labels that we use that give us a sense of security and safety? How about Christian? I am a Christian. I don't know about you, but that brings me a sense of security and safety in relation to God. Some may say, well, I am a believer in God. I am a member of the church of Christ. And we say that with pride, not arrogance. Maybe we say things like, well, we're, we live in a Christian nation. These are titles, labels, and mantras that often come out of our mouth. And this was consistent also with the children of Israel. But is our behavior consistent with our mantra? Are our actions and our words consistent with our title as Christians? Den of robbers. The fact that Jesus identified the robbers in their den implies those within the den are without security but in danger of judgment and condemnation. Essentially, Jesus is saying this You have meant for the Lord's temple to be a den of robbers, but, but I know where you hide. I know where you rest after committing your crime. You can't fool me. You are exposed. They were comfortable in their sin. They were comfortable in their unrighteousness. They were comfortable in their wickedness. Church, are we comfortable? Are we comfortable in our sin? Are we strutting the name Christian as a guise to consume, I'm sorry, as a costume to hide our sin? Here's a replica of the temple in Jesus' time. Jesus says that this temple is supposed to be a house of prayer. For who? All nations. The word nations in the Greek is ethnos. It's where we get the word ethnicities. You see where I'm going with this? Gentiles were not allowed to go into certain parts of the temple. In fact, they had a portion of the temple dedicated to the Gentiles that was considered or titled the court of the Gentiles. And you can see that place marked off on the screen. Here's something even more interesting. Archaeologists have discovered, back in 1800s, they discovered a stone with an inscription on it 
from the ruins of the Jerusalem temple. You know what it said on there? It said this. Foreigners must not enter inside the balustrade or into the forecourt around the sanctuary. Whoever is caught will have himself to blame for his ensuing death. This was the inscription in the Lord's house. An inscription of exclusion. An inscription of prejudice, of discrimination towards foreigners, towards those of different ethnicities. Tables were set up in the court of the Gentiles for the purpose of currency exchange and paying the temple tax along with purchasing pigeons, lambs, oils, whatever they may have needed to sacrifice to God. But the poor had to buy from the rich who constantly oppressed them. The poor would often spend all the money that they had to purchase the least expensive sacrificial animal or ingredient at extremely inflated prices. Many foreigners were cheated out of their money and charged increased fees for the exchange of temple currency for purchasing these sacrifices. So in the Lord's temple, during the time of Jesus, you could expect to hear bickering. You could expect to hear anger, arguing, complaining, and business transactions. I can imagine this is what Jesus heard as he walked through the temple in anger and in disbelief at what he saw. And when he saw this, you know what he did? He turned it over. What was the purpose of that, Jesus? What were you trying to get those in the temple to understand? All of this was happening in the court of the Gentiles to frustrate the intentions of non-Jews desiring a relationship with God. And that's why Jesus turned over the tables as an object lesson to denounce the false security that their fruitless worship brings. Jesus' anger was justified in the face of systemic oppression and inequality. Amen, church. Jesus' anger was justified in the face of racism, prejudice, and economic injustice. Jesus' anger was justified in the face of violence in the name of Judaism. Jesus' anger was justified because the Jews and those who were religious missed represented the temple of the Lord. All of these were barriers that hindered other nations, other ethnicities from coming to the Lord's temple to have a relationship with God to sacrifice and worship. The temple became a tool used by the Jews to frustrate the intentions of non-Jews desiring a relationship with God. So I asked the question this morning, me included, what barriers have we elected that might be hindering others from coming to Christ? I was told not to step on any toes this morning. I don't think I'm doing a good job. I'm stepping on mine too. Give me your ears, church. Looking simply at your Facebook page. Just at your Facebook. Would a person who votes Democrat feel welcomed in our assembly? Would a person who votes Republican feel welcomed in our assembly? Just looking at your Facebook page. Looking at my Facebook page. Would a person of color feel welcomed in our assembly? Would an illegal or undocumented immigrant feel welcomed in our assembly? Would a police officer feel welcomed in our assembly? 
Some say, well, it's just Facebook, not a big deal. Some person with divinity said this, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. His name is Jesus. And I would say, out of the abundance of the heart, the fingers post. You can say a name you can. <laughs> what we post on our social media is mostly an extension of what's in our heart, is it not? There comes a time when we must stop judging the world, because the world is going to behave like it should. Like the world. Amen, church. But there has to come a time where we examine ourselves and look inside our fellowship. And we have to ask ourselves, are we hindering people from coming to Christ? Because of what we post, because of what we say, and the people we surround ourselves with. There are people, church, in our fellowship that don't feel welcome. Church, we have to protect our relationships. I really appreciate Daniel's message for our protecting of the Lord's Supper, where he emphasizes the relational factor. We have to protect our fellowship. We have to protect our unity. We have to affirm our love for one another. When the culture outside of the church, when the world is dividing, we should be uniting. When the world is hating, we should be loving. When the world is divided, we should be showing unity. <sighs> Many who profess to be Christians but are void of Christ-like mentality towards others are just as deceitful as a leafy fig tree void of fruit. Outwardly, we look like Christ, but upon closer investigation, we are without fruit, myself included. Church Christianity is far more than church attendance. Christianity is far more than just participating in worship. Christianity is not just about our vertical relationship with God. It's about the horizontal relationship, too. The people beside you, in front of you, behind you. That is what Christianity is about. It's about relational integrity. The fig tree was no longer beneficial. It refused to offer relief, sustenance, and nutrition to those in need. In fact, the fig tree appeared to be inviting, but it was not willing to give what people were searching for. The temple participants refused to extend salvation and worship to everyone, which was in opposition to God's plan. If you read Isaiah chapter 56, Verses 1 through 8, you'll see how God intended the temple to be a place for all nations, for foreigners, for eunuchs, for anyone desiring a relationship. It was not a place of exclusion, it was a place of inclusion. And because the temple was not fruitful, because it did not fulfill God's purpose, it had to be destroyed. And it was. 70 AD. The temple walls would have to crumble in order for it to become the house of prayer that gives full acceptance to those desiring a relationship with God. Let me remind you. Let me remind myself. All baptized believers are the temple of God. The way God filled the holy temple in Jerusalem, He now lives in us. Am I right? In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, and Peter said to them on the day of Pentecost, preaching the first gospel sermon, he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive what? The gift of the Holy Ghost. God will take up residence inside you, in your heart. 
to help you to be transformed into the image of Christ. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, Paul says to the church of Corinth, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? We are now the new temple of God. Anyone who has responded to the gospel, you are his temple. Let me ask you, how are we behaving in God's temple? How are we interacting with others in God's temple? What's coming out of our mouths in God's temple? Is it a game of thieves? Is it a house of prayer? Is it a place of exclusion? Think about the circles in your life. The people that you love and fellowship with the most, is it just an echo chamber of them giving back to you what you believe that may be dividing the church or excluding others? We are God's temple. We don't push anybody away that desires a relationship with God. We include them. We bring them into our home. We bring them into our fellowship. Amen, church. Racism and prejudice do not automatically disappear just because we are believers. Church, our Sunday morning worship is still segregated. Martin Luther King was right. And it still runs true today. Sunday morning is the most segregated day of the week. And we can look around and see that right now. There's still Black Church of Christ, White Church of Christ, very few are integrated, which means the culture from the past is still having an effect on us in the present. But makes it very unique, is it not? I thank you for being forward thinking and accepting a minister person of color, because not many churches are doing that. Let me move on. I don't want to get too political, which I probably already have. All right, so what was Jesus' response? How did Jesus respond to Peter? Because we see after the temple situation is over, Peter approaches the barren fig tree, and he says this. In Mark chapter 11, verse 20 through 22, in the morning, as they went around, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. And Peter remembered to Jesus, he remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. And I'll be honest, trying to exegete Jesus' response was very, very difficult for me in understanding what Jesus was trying to relate to Peter as, as a result of his response. So I'll just do the best that I can. And Jesus answered, Peter, have faith in God. So I would encourage you today, keep having faith. What was Jesus essentially saying to Peter? Jesus is saying, Peter, I'm not done yet. Amen, church. Have faith in God. This isn't the end. I'm still working. The withered tree was a prophecy of the future destruction of the temple. So Jesus' statement was meant to bring assurance to Peter. Jesus was saying, though the temple will be destroyed like this fig tree, I'm not done yet. Though people are being oppressed in the Lord's temple, Jesus is telling Peter, I'm not done yet. People are being taken advantage of and excluded. And Jesus is telling Peter, have faith because I'm not done yet. Though the Lord's church may be divided in many states and cities right now, guess what? God isn't done yet. Though we may be divided socially and politically and segregated, God's not done yet. Though we may not always behave like Christians, and that's why we are in desperate need of God's grace and His salvation. God isn't done yet. He's not done with me and He's not done with you. Amen? And then Jesus says, keep praying. In Mark chapter 11, verse 24, 
Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. So Jesus is calling Peter to be what the temple was not. A house of prayer. He says, Peter, keep praying, though the temple is not the house of prayer in which I had intended, you'll be the house of prayer. When religious leaders fail you, when the church is not what you think it should be, you be the change. It's not an excuse to abandon the church, to withdraw from the church, to emancipate yourself from the church. No. It's an opportunity for, for you to be what the church is not. Amen. Any deficiencies we observe in the Lord's church, we satisfy them in our personal life. And we see that's something Peter struggled with later on, did he not? Number three, keep forgiving. Mark 11, 25a. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone. Church, forgiveness prevents exclusion, does it not? Forgiveness keeps you in an open and receptive relationship to others. Those who claim Christianity, you and I, we are not exempt from offending one another. Right? We, we are still a work in progress. We're going to say and do things that rub one another the wrong way. And the reality is, Peter is saying, these are religious people. Yes, yes, they have sinned, but what is your response to their sin? You forgive them. Maintain an attitude of forgiveness. And this is something that Jesus had to tell Peter several times in his ministry. Am I right? In order to continue in love and unity with our brothers and sisters, forgiveness is essential. Number four, keep self-examining. 25b. So that your Father who is in heaven may forgive you of your trespasses. Jesus tells Peter, Remember your sins. As you see the sins of those serving and working in the temple, as you see the sins of the people who claim a relationship with God, don't forget about yours. Too often we hear sermons and we think about other people, but what would happen if we looked introspectively? What would happen if we examined ourselves and said, what are things that I need to grow in? What are areas in which I need to mature as a Christian? Jesus reminds Peter that he is also in need of God's forgiveness. As I close, are you here this morning? Are you here and you are not yet a dwelling place for the Lord to take up residence? In John chapter 15, verse 4, Jesus says what? Remain in me, and then I will remain in you. Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless it remains in the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. If Jesus is not in us, there is nothing that we can do of moral and spiritual significance. Jesus has to be in us. Well, how do we get into Jesus? Galatians 3.27, For as many of you who have been baptized into Christ. Right? We are baptized into Christ. That's how we get into Jesus. We put on Christ. And once we wear the name Christian, we are now God's temple and we are able to go out into the world and bear the fruit in which Jesus is searching for. Thank you. This concludes our video. If you're looking for more content like this, you can find more on our YouTube channel as well as our website. If you are looking to join us in person, we would love to have you join us for worship or Bible class on Sunday mornings starting at 930 and 1030. And you can also join us for our live stream for both of those if you're joining us from the web. Thank you so much. God bless and have a great week.